This meeting is being recorded. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Sheila Gilhini. I'm with um, Alcohol Action Ireland. Um, I'd like to very much welcome you to our event today, Out of Balance, Alcohol Policy in Ireland. Now, I can see people are just starting to come in, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes uh, and let people get settled in. Uh, and uh, I'm so pleased we've had a, a very good turnout. Lots of people actually uh, were signing up even this morning. So we're, <clears throat> we're very pleased to, to welcome you to our event. I'll say before we, we get going properly, I will just uh, note that we are that the, the event is being recorded and we'll be circulating the, the link to the recording afterwards. And I'll also just mention as well that uh, we have the chat box, uh, we have a panel discussion at the end. So if there are particular questions that um, are arising for you during the event, please just stick them into the chat box and uh, we'll do our best to get to them in our panel discussion at, at the end of the event. Okay, well, do you know what? I think we'll just start and get going at, at this point. And, um, uh, and and for those who are coming in a little bit later, the, the recording will, will be available. So our event today, Out of Balance, Alcohol Policy in Ireland, has been, um, we, we've, we've put it out for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, today, uh, this week is um, Alcohol Awareness Week across Europe. So there's been a lot of different activities which have been highlighting elements around alcohol and alcohol policy, both here in Ireland and, and further afield. In fact, we were delighted to have uh, WHO Europe in, in, in town, in Dublin on Monday, um, and really you know, making the case very strongly for the need for coherent alcohol policy. Our event today also uh, marks the launch of uh, a new report that we have out called uh, Where's the Urgency? And it's a review of the Public Health Alcohol Act of 2018. And what we have done in the report is really to look and see where have the, the measures that were first put forward um, to try and help reduce alcohol use in, in Ireland on the attendant harms world. So we've been really putting looking at see what has been done what should be done and what remains to be done and what are the barriers that are maybe kind of getting in the way of that. And as part of um, our, our process around that, we'll be, we're joined today by a number of guests um, who are going to help us kind of explore some of, um, some of those aspects um, of, of alcohol policy and where the PHAA is working and maybe perhaps where it's not. So uh, we have our, our guest this morning is Dr. Zubair Kabir from University College Cork from the School of Public Health. And we're also joined by Dr. Nathan Critchlow from the University of Stirling. And our panel discussion at the end will be chaired by Dr. Bobby Smith, consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. And Bobby is also uh, the vice chair of the board of Alcohol Action Ireland. <clears throat> So it's now four years since the passage of the Public Health Alcohol Act. And really, that was a historic piece of, of legislation because it was the first time in the history of the state that Ireland took a public health approach to alcohol policy. And measures such as uh, minimum unit pricing, health information labelling, controls and advertising, structural separation, they were just some of the, the, the areas of, of alcohol policy. What I want to do myself is uh, maybe just to do a little bit of a run through some of, um, of those measures. And I'm just going to share my screen here. And just give me a moment while we, uh, we get that up. And hopefully the screen is there now. It is indeed. So what I would like to do is just to take a, a, a run through what, what is in the, the, the Act. Now, I suppose I, I should also just say, you know, who we are ourselves. So as many of you, I know I'm, I'm really amongst friends here, um, would know that we are the independent advocate for reducing alcohol harm. Our strategic plan, which we've been working on over the, the last number of years, and which will take us up to 2024, there's a number of key, key points, but you'll see our number one a goal that we have set ourselves over the, the course of these five years is coherent and urgent implement, implementation of that uh, Public Health Alcohol Act. 
No, uh, it's uh, the, these sorts of graphs. So sometimes, you know, you get a little bit of despair. We look and see, well, what is the alcohol consumption uh, level in Ireland? And, you know, it's been a bit, bit of a wavy path. I have to say in the last number of years, it is starting to come down. But sadly, I would say that, you know, those last two years, probably the reduction that we saw in, in alcohol consumption was more to do with COVID measures, with pubs and restaurants and hospitality being, being closed. And we certainly think there's a good indication from some early figures that actually we could be rebounding back up to 2019 levels. And if we come back up to 2019 levels, well, I'll just give you a, a hint of what that looks like. Um, you know, sometimes we put these things in, you know, litres per capita, but if we actually look at it, you know, from a, an alcohol use per drinker it, it's really quite a lot um so per drinker something like 235 cans of beer and 11 bottles of, of gin or vodka and 39 bottles of wine and 35 cans of cider you know sometimes when i look at those figures i think gosh surely, surely we only mean one of those things but actually we mean all of them all all put together per drinker and I suppose that really points to the fact that alcohol is, is endemic in, in our society. It's so widely available, so widely used and is seen as normal. That level of drinking is seen as, as normal. But as you can guess, um, and not guess, and it's, uh, it's, there's no guessing in this, um, the, the impact of that alcohol use really, really makes itself felt. And there's so many different ways in which we could describe it. Um, we could point to the fact that something like 15% of the Irish population have an alcohol use disorder. That's looking at the individual. You could look at that in a wider context and you could say that we know that at least 200,000 children right now are living with parental problem alcohol use. And we know that that's a particular thing that has a lifetime legacy. And um, there's something like about 400,000 adults who are living with that, that particular legacy, with all of the implications that it has on mental health, actually on physical health, and on wider um, issues as well, like relationships, education, so many different aspects that, that can be there. Go back and look, you know, again to the individual. And, you know, we did some work recently with uh, Zubair in, in UCC, and we know that there's something like four deaths every day from alcohol. And, you know, that that's adding up, that's, you know, um, nearly 1,500 deaths every year. And I often think if we were talking about this as deaths on the road, we would have a national outcry about it. But a lot of these deaths, they, they impact silently on the families huge pain, huge trauma, but there isn't a central agency that's really looking and saying, gosh, those deaths, how are they, how are they impacting on, 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 on wider society? If we were to look at it from a financial point of view, um, we know that there's a massive cost to our health service, something like about 10% of um, the, the annual health budget would go on, you know, addressing some of the harms from, from alcohol. And in a wider context, we were looking at things like justice and uh, other issues around social care. It's at least 3.6 billion. And I really do mean it is at least is probably actually considerably higher because those figures date back nearly a decade at, at this stage. So the Public Health Alcohol Act, um, many of you have, I know are very familiar with it, um, but just to kind of run through some of the central points of what, what was within it. And, and to remind ourselves again that it actually came out of um, a seminal piece of work, um, a, a report that was put together actually under the former um, Chief Medical um, Officer, Dr. Tony Houlihan, and who put forward, who really looked at, at what, what was it what was at play and said, you know, if we're going to try and reduce the level of alcohol harm in, in Ireland, we need to look and see what does the WHO say? What does the World Health Organization say are the best buys? And those best buys, as you know, are controls on pricing, controls on availability, controls on, on marketing. And these, the, 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 the provisions that are within the Public Health Alcohol Act do kind of reflect some, you know, mostly of that. Now, I will say they were probably watered down considerably. This was the most contested piece of legislation in, in, the, in the history of the state, uh, over three years of, of debate um, in, in our, our office. But what we finally got, um, and I'm just going to go through the positives that we have, we have minimum unit pricing. <clears throat> and we're very proud that we have that. We uh, we're very, very conscious that um, we benefited from other countries, you know, you know, looking at MEP and in particular our close neighbour Scotland, who introduced it a couple of years before ourselves. So MEP um, was set at a rate of one euro per standard drink, or that's about 10 grams of alcohol. So that corresponds to like a small glass of wine or a, 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 um, a half pint of beer. Uh, and that came into play from January of this year. 
We also have regulation on um, on some advertising regulation. So what, what is already in, in place is that there's a prohibition on advertising in particular places. So for example, on uh, public transport, on uh, billboards that would be close to schools or close to um, within 200 meters of public amenities. And there's also restrictions on ad advertising during particular events. So in, in sporting um, uh, games, there is a prohibition on actually showing, um, say, logos for, for alcohol on the field of play of sport. Now, that's a long way from being a complete ban on uh, sport, alcohol sports sponsorship, which was originally what would have been um, being proposed, but it was watered down to that. But it is something that does take away a, a bit from the intensity of the, the amount of, of alcohol marketing that you would see during, during a match. There is provision uh, for the health service to be notified about um, a license, an alcohol license being an uh, application go going in. And there's also some prohibitions on uh, advertising in, on children's clothing and on advertising in cinemas. There's a, a very important piece, which is about the separation and the visibility um, of alcohol. So now that when you go into shops, there is uh, basically there's a, there's a set of measures that put alcohol over to one side. Um, it's not perfect, but it is at least something there. And the whole idea there is really, I suppose, getting across a message that alcohol is no ordinary product. And it's not the same as, you know, going in to buy the pint of milk or whatever to have a bottle of wine sitting beside it. That you're really just trying to make a difference uh, of saying that it isn't isn't the same as other grocery products. And again, a little bit um, of control around the sale and supply. So things like special offers, you know, two for the price of one, that that sort of thing has has been uh, you know, eliminated. But we still have some very important elements that um, haven't yet been um, put into, into place. We're still waiting for labelling, although we are moving forward. I'm going to come back to talk about that. We, have, we haven't yet got as far as our broadcast watershed or indeed a very important one, the content of, of um, advertisements. But MEP, as I say, we are delighted that it came in. I have to say a huge amount of uh, furore at the start of the year uh, when, when that came into play. But actually, I would say that it has been accepted uh, at, at this stage. The one thing that I really notice about MEP uh, have, having uh, come into action is that you don't see the huge big slabs of um, uh, you know, beer, uh, beer cans being, being uh, you know, put on for sale. And I would say that there's, you know, that that's where industry has really adjusted. It has also done things like, you know, for example, maybe reduce the alcohol content in, in, in some beers. Um, and, you know, you know, these are these are small measures, but they definitely, I think, will make an impact. We would be hoping um, the modelling for MEP suggested that there could be a reduction of something like about 8% in alcohol use as a result. We'll see how that works out by, by the end of the year. And as I say, this is a tricky year because hospitality opened up and we're aware, you know, that um, there was just a bit more alcohol obviously going to be made available th through that. But we would hope for some impact, you know, from MEP. The structural separation, I'm not going to talk too much about that because Zubair is going to talk a little bit more on that. But as I say, it is a very important element of it in, in, that, in that goal of trying to say that alcohol is no ordinary product. Um, the outdoor uh, advertising restrictions, again, I don't want to say just too much about this because Nathan is going to talk a little bit about it, but um, I, I know myself that uh, certainly, you know, going in on the bus and, and to work, I really felt the difference that you weren't seeing alcohol advertisements in, um, you know, at, at every bus stop on every bus that was going past. Now, unfortunately, what we do, uh, we are seeing in, in, the, in the last year or so is actually a huge increase in the level of um, advertisement for alcohol free uh, products which are using identical branding to their alcohol co um, counterparts and uh, certainly you know when you look at um, the, the alcohol free market so from a beer point of view it's, it's about uh, just over 1% and 1.3% of beer sales are in the alcohol free area and yet we're seeing a level of marketing that's way in excess of the size of the, of the market that's there and you'd have to be saying well really are we are we are they advertising as the industry advertising an alcohol free product or are they advertising their brand um i mentioned about the um the sports um uh, arena and you know we are aware that 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 there, that that it's not really just about the advertisement or the the marketing branding that you might see on on the pitch a very important element actually around um the the, the alcohol marketing is the fact that we know that children watch 
a huge amount of sports. In fact, actually seven out of, of t- 10 uh, favourite TV shows are actually Irish sports broadcasts. And we know that there's a massive amount of advertising of, of alcohol that goes on during those big, big games. What would really make the difference is that, uh, I'll just go back, sorry. What would really make the difference is if, if the broadcast threshold actually, or the watershed actually came into play, we would see a huge reduction in the amount of advertising that children would, would be seeing. Going on to labelling, well, here we are four years on from 2018 and we don't see labels on our bottles yet, but um, where we're at is that uh, the secondary uh, regulations around labelling, so this is the, 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 the specific information that would say how big the label should be, the colour of the label, what exactly would, would be on it, that secondary um, legislation, the regulations have been, um, are, are currently in the EU TRIST process. So they were, the EU was notified about uh, these regulations back in June of this year. There's a three month standstill period during which um, uh, stakeholders can um, make comment on, on the, the, the labeling regulations. Uh, we were really pleased to note actually that 70% of the submissions that were received by the EU were in favor of these, uh, the, these regulations and the remaining 30%, no surprise, would have come from uh, the alcohol industry. Because the number of countries also put in um, uh, comments uh, about that or issued opinions, the, the, uh, the standstill period has now been extended by another three months, so it runs up until the 22nd of December. But all going well, if, uh, if the Commission are happy, you know, that, that this isn't a uh, um, a block on free trade and, and that, that the measures that are being proposed are proportionate and in keeping with the public health uh, issues that, that Ireland face, the minister would be in a position in January of, of next year to, to just go ahead and say, yes, let's have this labelling. We'll wait to see if that happens, um, but I am very, very encouraged that we've got to this point and, and I'm very conscious as well of how we are being watched on this you know, not just here in Ireland, across Europe and right across the globe, because particularly that warning, there are a series of warnings, um, but one of them is for uh, a warning given the link between alcohol and cancer, the link between alcohol and liver disease, and a warning about pregnancy, uh, about not drinking in, in pregnancy. And these are all three things that are just incredibly important. You, you know, we're, we're aware of the level of FASD in, in Ireland. Sadly, Ireland is one of the you know, pre- previous research would have suggested that we're actually one of the top three countries in the world for drinking in, in pregnancy. So it is a matter of absolute urgency that uh, these regulations would come into play. As I mentioned, that advertising broadcast watershed, uh, it isn't just me who's saying this, or it isn't just Alcohol Action Ireland who are looking for this. 70% of um, the population are absolutely in favour of this. Um, you know, and it's just, it's it's beyond belief why we're having to wait so long to, to kind of get this. But uh, it's a very important element and we were very, very keen that we would see this being implemented as soon as possible. And then content of advertising. Well, I've got kind of a blank looking um, uh, slide here and it's blank for two reasons, because we're nowhere near. We just have no information at all about what is happening in, in relation to that. But also, I suppose, I kind of thinking, that's the way it should be. We shouldn't be having all these myths and the, the happy clappy look, you know, the sophisticated, you know, linking of our likes and our passions, whether it's sport or music and all the ways in which the industry so cleverly captures us in, in this way. You know, the, the legislation is, you know, provides for a very straightforward type of advertisement, name, place where you can get it, the cost of it, that type of thing, as opposed to this mythology that, that we have um, become so familiar with. Now, of course, while all of this is happening at a very, very slow pace, there's been other legislation that's, that's going in, which really does overlap with us in some ways. And one particular thing is the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill. And we have been trying very, very hard to make sure that alcohol advertisement is included in this, because unfortunately, there is nothing in the PHAA that says anything about um, advertising on the, the internet. One thing in particular we would like to see is that children should not be targeted uh, while they're online. And, uh, you know, we, we, that, 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 reg- that um, legislation is, is moving its way through the Oireachtas. And I have to say, this has been an uphill battle really to try and keep saying that the PHAA does not cover this. And this is a very important element uh, in addressing alcohol marketing. 
meantime, another bill has, has just reared up um, in, in, in the last uh, number of weeks, the sale of alcohol bill, which came out from the Department of Justice back in uh, last month in, in October. And, you know, we have multiple concerns uh, about this bill. Um, I, I've just listed out like a, a number of them here. But, you know, first and foremost, there's no public health intent to the bill. There's nothing at the top of the bill that says the purpose of this legislation is to, you know, look at it, look at alcohol licensing from a public health point of view. That's simply not not there at all. We're we, we are concerned that some of the things that with, within the bill would be things like an extension in the, um, the, the, the alcohol trading hours. Um, and in, in particular, we see, you know, late night opening of bars to, to 2.30 and extension nightclub hours to, to 6 a.m. But also there's a whole other section which is about, you know, allowing for cultural immunity licenses to be granted to venues that wouldn't normally have a license. So that's things like, you know, museums, galleries, theatres, cinemas, uh, all sorts of you know, maybe pop up events that, that, that would be happening. And a, a, another uh, element of concern is that um, there's been a revoking of the requirement to extinguish a license before opening a new premises. And we would really have a very big concern that that would lead to an increase in the density of alcohol outlets. So uh, again, a fairly straightforward and simple um, slide here. You know, you increase the opening hours, you increase the density, you will get increased alcohol use. And with increased alcohol use, you will invariably see increased harms. We're actually in, in, at, 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 at the moment putting together a submission to the Oireachtas Committee on Justice, which is examining um, the, uh, the, the legislation. And I, I was really struck myself that when you actually drill down into it and look at the research around that, it's astonishing that, you know, just the, the, the research that really does point to you know, things like if you increase uh, opening hours, we have, we have evidence from, from Norway, for example, that says that for every extra hour, of, um, of, of alcohol availability, you see something like about a 15% increase in uh, alcohol related uh, assaults. Um, with uh, the density of uh, alcohol outlets, what we have really found is that there's a very close link between that density and an increase in domestic abuse. You know, and these, these are things that are just, you know, really do have to be called out. Um, a, a thanks here to Colin Angus because while I was doing my research and just looking around, he uh, came up with a lovely set of uh, of graphs that really showed that Ireland is not short of a pub or two, and um, we we actually, if you measure it according to our population density, we're something like about the the fourth um, highest level of um, pub capacity in in Europe. Now, alongside that, having given out about you know things that I think the government are doing wrong, um, we're very interested that uh, a gambling regulation bill, uh, the general scheme of that, is, is was was just agreed at cabinet um, a couple of weeks ago. And actually, the more we think and look about you know what's being done around gambling, the more encouraged I am that the government is taking a public health approach here. So the focus of this bill, for example, is putting public um, safety and well-being at the heart of it. It proposes a complete ban on internet ad advertising. It also has the, the idea of the advertising broadcast watershed, uh, as we would have for, for alcohol. It also is proposing a social impact fund, something that we talk about a lot, that, you know, a kind of a polluter pays policy, that there, there needs to be a levy on industry for the treatment, for research and for education. I think we could say the same for, for alcohol there. But very interestingly is that it also has the legislation for the establishment of a gambling regulatory authority, which would actually have control of all aspects of what we've just talked about there for the licensing of, of gambling, for the monitoring of uh, advertisements, and also for the commissioning of, of research. And I think there's an awful lot that we could look at and we could say, if only we had that for alcohol. I think that that's, that's something that I would certainly like to come back and talk a little bit more about it. We do need a, st a single state office that would take control of all aspects of alcohol policy. So um, I began actually, you know, we uh, the, the title of our event today is Out of Balance, question mark, you know, alcohol policy in Ireland. You know, there are many, many ways in which we could try and answer that question. We could say, you know, we know that there's something like 50,000 children start to drink every year. And as a balance to that, we have well, out of balance, we have uh, children being exposed to a tsunami of alcohol marketing. We have something like 200,000 children 
who are living with with a parent with 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 an alcohol problem, and yet at the same time we're talking about a, extending licensing hours and extending uh, and and enhancing the density of of alcohol outlets very much out of balance. But if we were bring it back to to money, which sometimes I think you know people will maybe kind of recognize more than anything else, although that, though that does annoy me. If we actually look at the harms, something like about 3.7 billion in harm caused to Irish society. And yet against that, we have alcohol excess duties that bring in about 1.2 billion. I think the answer to me is very clear. Alcohol policy is well and truly out of balance. Okay, so I'll, that um, I will leave at, at that point. And what I'd like to do actually at this point is to hand over to our next uh, speaker. Uh, so Zubair Kabir. Um, Zubair has done a huge amount of work um, uh, around public health matters. And uh, Zubair, if you would like to start to do, you have your screen coming up. Thank you indeed. Zubair is working at um, the School of Public Health in UCC. Uh, as is mentioned earlier, we have been working with Zubair around the global burden of disease study, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. But he has authored many, many uh, publications, both in Lancet and Nature, Nature Medicine, uh, through that global collaboration. And I also a very interesting thing that I know that Zubair has is particular research experience in tobacco control. And I think there are an awful lot of lessons for us to learn you know, from tobacco in terms of being able to address alcohol harm. So Zubair, I'll hand over to you at this point and uh, thank you and, and look forward to your contribution. Thanks, Sheila, for the nice introduction and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard from Sheila, this is the topic which I'll be touching on and Sheila, flag some of the uh, sections of the Public Health Alcohol Act. I'll be dealing with the specific section, section 22, and the compliance of mixed trade retailers with the section uh, across two time periods, six months uh, post implementation and 18 months post implementation. And this piece of work uh, is a collaborative piece of work between the School of Public Health at UCC and the Alcohol Action Ireland, uh, funded through the Irish Research Council new foundations uh, award sorry can, can, can I, okay yeah sorry about that so this piece we got published uh, on st patrick's day in think global health uh, just highlighting the uh, the high rate of alcohol-related deaths and injury in Ireland. And, and just to signal what uh, Sheila just mentioned earlier, the, 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 sorry, the alcohol-related harm uh, we are uh, grappling with uh, in Ireland. And again, I think Sheila touched on these things. Alcohol is inextricably linked with the Irish society. And you heard the number of pubs per capita in Ireland. So obviously alcohol is no ordinary commodity uh, and has societal cost. You just heard from uh, Sheila. And more importantly, there are four premature deaths uh, every day in Ireland, which are alcohol related. So we are conscious of the nightlife, uh, but at the same time, we need to be uh, aware of the uh, premature mortality and morbidity attributable to alcohol every day in Ireland. Uh, you also heard that uh, we are not doing great in terms of the alcohol consumption uh, globally and also within the OECD countries. As of now in 2019, the adult uh, alcohol consumption uh, per capita stood at 10.8 liters. And you, you saw all those, uh, how it translates into everyday drinking habits. Uh, this this uh, uh, level is way above the global average of close to seven liters per capita and even higher than the uh, OECD countries uh, average which stands just less than nine. So Ireland has the dubious distinction of being the ninth highest per capita alcohol consumption among the OECD countries and also the eighth highest rate of monthly binge drinking globally. So uh, that's uh, uh, striking statistics. So fortunately, after those three years debate, uh, uh, as you heard uh, from Sheila, uh, from former chief medical officer, Tony Holland with his uh, leadership, 
you got this uh, legislated in September uh, 2018, and you heard all the elements of that. So I'll be just touching on one specific section, section 22 of this Public Health Alcohol Act uh, 2019. And this section 22 uh, was delayed. It was enforced on uh, 12th November, 2020. So two years after the legislation was passed. So section 22 of this act entails, as you heard, the structural separation and the visibility of alcohol products and advertisements for alcohol products in, in specified uh, licensed premises. So I'll, I'll go more uh, into, into the uh, elements of this uh, act. So we set out to study uh, with my uh, uh, master students of public health at the School of Public Health across two cohorts to assess the compliance of the section 22 across two time periods uh, post the implementation in only Cork City. So uh, we didn't have the resources to, to uh, explore this nationwide, but at least it, it gives us a flavor on, on the compliance. And we looked at approximately six months post the implementation and then uh, 12 months after the first uh, uh, study was done. Uh, as you heard, the, we did in Cork City, we got a hold on to the list of all license holders uh, from the Revenue Commissioner's website. We took a convenience sampling, which is not a great uh, uh, technique uh, in epidemiology, but again, uh, in terms of logistics and resources, we did uh, 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 adopt this technique of mixed trade retailers. So that's where the legislation uh, enforces on. You have to have this separation uh, on fixed and mixed trade retailers, not the standalone of license, they were excluded. And we had on-site visits. And as I said, uh, uh, the on-site visits were done by my two uh, master students across two cohorts. The baseline survey, uh, we visited uh, 92 uh, uh, stores in Cork uh, in May 2021, 20, and 90 of those agreed to participate. And we had to go through all these ethics and consent, and but we couldn't take any photographs uh, because of confidentiality and data protection issues. So once they signed the consent, they agreed not signing anything, agreeing, okay, then, then our researcher uh, went around with the a checklist, which is the, uh, which was based on the Irish government guidance to business and the link uh, below is there. Uh, whereas the follow-up which happened uh, 18 months after the implementation in July and August 2022, we had a lower number. So we managed to visit 45 stores within Cork City, uh, uh, 12 of them declined to, to participate. Uh, and and uh, the reasons are not obvious why they didn't participate. So the definition of mixed trade retailers, they include both franchised and independent supermarkets, convenience stores, and these are the definitions we have for this. So going more detail into these uh, uh, section 22 of the act, uh, the first one is to have a single and closed storage unit at one specific point of sale area. Uh, where you need to comply with. So you see uh, there is a, a, this uh, unit, uh, there's a door and all the alcohol products uh, and advertising will be within that. So it's not accessible to anyone, it's not visible. So only when you open this door, uh, they are visible, but most when it is not used, it should be closed. So that is the first uh, 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 provision. And along with this, you have other three options, which you may opt one of those, or you can have one of these options, but not go with the a closed uh, enclosed unit at the point of sale. The option A is about having a single uh, area, reserved area for alcohol and alcohol related products separated by a physical barrier. And the minimum height of this physical barrier should be 1.2 meters and everything is behind this the alcohol products and the advertisements. So only when you open this, you know, someone gets into it and they will be exposed to the products and the advertisements. So that is one of the options. The second option is you can have a, a series of enclosed storage units adjacent to each other, but there are specifications. It should be a, a of maximum height of 2.2 meters, but the visibility should be at least 1.5 meters. 
And the third option is uh, uh, you can display alcohol products and advertisements, but you can have a maximum of only three uh, storage units adjacent to each other. And again, there are specifications of the size. It can't be more than, the height can't be more than 2.2 meters and the width can't be more than one meters. So based on this, uh, on this premise, uh, the findings we have for both the uh, uh, waves baseline, we see that uh, the compliance was relatively low. Uh, it was approximately six months post the implementation, which is quite understandable. Whereas in the follow-up, uh, we had a very high compliance. So 94% were compliant here. 18 months post the implementation, all the numbers are, are small. And this is, uh, bear in mind, this is only the Cork City. And of those who declined to participate, most of them were from the franchised convenience and supermarkets. And these are the distribution across both the independent stores and the franchise stores across these two uh, waves. And then uh, drilling down more into uh, granular data by stores, we see that the, in the baseline study, the non-compliance are more uh, for the franchised uh, supermarkets and convenience store and also with the independent convenience stores. So the orange ones uh, describe the non-compliance ones, where the uh, blue, one, blue bars represent the compliance ones. Whereas in the follow-up study, only two were non-compliant uh, out of 33 who were surveyed and those two non-compliant stores were from the franchised convenience stores. And then looking at specific uh, uh, articles of the act, uh, we see that the most popular option was having one single enclosed unit at the point of sale. Uh, at the baseline there were 83, uh, but compliance was lower compared uh, uh, with the follow-up one where there was 100% compliance with the uh, enclosed uh, a single unit at the point of sale. And there are other variations across the options uh, across these two time periods. So whereas the you can see uh, at the follow-up, the compliance across all these options were uh, relatively high uh, compared to the baseline. So uh, to conclude, as you heard uh, from Sheila, that the implementation of this landmark legislation has been delayed. Uh, and then we saw uh, uh, improvement on the compliance uh, between these two study waves. Uh, a point to be noted uh, that is a convenience sample of one geography location. So you cannot generalize uh, to the whole of Ireland, but uh, it would be uh, crucially important to, to have a national uh, picture of compliance. Uh, and these both the studies were done during the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, when most of the retail stores were closed, you heard from Sheila. So it's crucially important to monitor the adult per capita consumption. Uh, we had set an earlier target of 9.1 liters uh, uh, in the way back in 2012, and, and it should have been achieved within a seven year period, but we haven't uh, reached that. Although, as you heard from Sheila, the most of the retail stores were closed and we saw a dip in the, in the pandemic, but that may not be an accurate reflection of the adult consumption uh, uh, in Ireland. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Irish Research Council for funding, my colleagues from the Alcohol Action Ireland Board, Dr. Sheila Gilhaney and Mr. Yunan McKinney, and my two students, uh, Mr. Kian Maxwini of the 21-22 cohort and Dr. Johnny Alatkin of the of the next cohort. So thanks for attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Zubair. And you know, I am encouraged actually to see that you know, reason, you know, high level of of compliance. Certainly, one thing I think it is very important is that the HSE would have sufficient resources to be able to continuously you know monitor and make sure that all aspects of um, PHAA are, are being fully complied with. 
OK, so Nathan, I'm going to move over to yourself now. Uh, Nathan from the University of Stirling, who's going to be looking at uh, how have alcohol companies responded to Ireland's restrictions on alcohol advertising and sponsorship. Nathan is uh, an academic fellow at the Institute for Social Marketing and Health at the University of Stirling. And uh, I know that you particularly uh, specialise in analysing the commercial determinants of health, the impact of marketing exposure on health related attitudes and behaviour and the regulation of marketing practice. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Sheila. Uh, Zubay, can you stop sharing your screen so that I can then share mine? It won't let me do it while you're still hosting. Cool. Right. Let's give that a go. And then let's do that. Hopefully you'll let me know if you can you see my slides? We can do. Cool. That's great. Uh, yep. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks very much to Alcohol Action Ireland for both hosting the webinar and inviting me to come and speak at it. Um, what's happening in Ireland is important both nationally and internationally as well. We have very scant evidence on the impact of many statutory controls on alcohol marketing. So what's happening in Ireland provides a really important and unique real world opportunity to generate real world evidence about both the implementation and effectiveness of these controls. So just get my slides to move. Uh, there we go. So this is a declaration of interest slide, but it kind of serves more as a little introduction to myself as well. So I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Social Marketing and Health. Um, a lot of my research is around evaluating components of a Public Health Alcohol Act. And um, that's particularly through a fellowship I received from the Society for the Study of Addiction, but I also do that in partnership with the Institute for Public Health in Ireland. I've also provided uh, advice to and, consult and conducted consultancy work for the Public Health Alcohol Research Group. As a body established by the Minister of Health in Ireland to provide advice on monitoring and evaluating um, aspects of the Act. I have previously worked with Alcohol Action Ireland on a couple of reports and the most recent of those was published last year looking at alcohol marketing uh, during the Six Nations tournament and very briefly on other things I used to be on the board of directors at Alcohol Focus Scotland. I used to work for Cancer Research UK and I don't have any current or previous funding from a commercial entity that would be considered a conflict of interest in this circle. So I don't need to go through this in much detail, Zubi and Sheila have really covered it. Um, the Public Health Act is a veritable greatest hits of all the different things that you could do to control how alcohol is advertised, marketed, pr priced, promoted, etc. Um, my research is specifically interested in the components that look at advertising, marketing and sponsorship. So in practice, that means the sections that commenced in November uh, 2019, particularly the ban on alcohol advertising in certain places, for example, around schools or on public transport. And I'm also interested in the restrictions that commenced in November of last year, particularly around sport. So advertising within the sporting area or sponsorship of certain events. I'm definitely interested in some of the things that haven't been implemented yet, as Sheila highlighted as well, particularly restricting the content of adverts to only factual information and health warnings and the broadcast watershed. But we're still waiting for those to commence. So this is a bit of a shameless plug for some research which is forthcoming. It's not the main focus of today's presentation, but one of the main parts of my fellowship is that I'm evaluating what impact Ireland's advertising restrictions have on how often and where consumers recall seeing alcohol advertising. So that's with the Society for Study of Addiction and Institute for Public Health. So we've been conducting repeat cross-sectional surveys, um, always conducting women in Ireland, and latterly have also been collecting some data in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, we conducted the first wave of these surveys in October 2019 before any of the restrictions commenced and then we followed up in October 2020 um, and October 2021, so up to two years after the initial restrictions on alcohol advertising were implemented. And we've just finished collecting data in October of this year, which will be one year after the sports sponsorship restrictions. And each of those waves, we've been asking about a thousand adults in Ireland um, where and how often they recall seeing alcohol advertising in the past month. They can say anything from every day to not at all um, or not sure. Um, we've been capturing data across the restricted activities and those which weren't restricted as well. Um, and this is pretty much forthcoming. It's been accepted. It's in press. So it should be out any day now um, in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs. I'm not going to be talking too much in detail about that, although happy to discuss um, either later or out with this meeting. But the reason I'm showing this slide is because what the most interesting thing, well, one of the most interesting things for me is that both one and two years after the restrictions commenced in November 2019, you still have a fairly substantial proportion of adults who recall seeing alcohol marketing through restricted channels. We've got around about 40% who say that they saw advertising for alcohol on public transport in the last month, despite that being a total ban. We've got around about 60% for posters and billboards. Boards, and round about a fifth who recall seeing it through the cinema. 
And there's a couple of plausible explanations for this. One is that it's self-reported data and asking people to recall where and how often they saw marketing is hard. People have errors in recall. They have misreporting in online surveys, et cetera. It's probably partly the reason, but when you look at the size of the numbers, I would suggest that actually this is probably too substantial to just be an artifact of how we collected the data. So the other plausible explanation is that participants recall, still recall seeing aspects of alcohol branding in these restricted places, which suggests that the marketing, marketing hasn't just necessarily disappeared, but the strategies have um, adapted. And one of the best ways to try and gain a little bit of insight of that is to take off my researcher hat and to start acting like a consumer and go and observe the marketing in these spaces and see what alcohol brand cues still remain. So that's exactly um, one of the things that I've done. And we found that alcohol marketing strategy seems to have been adapting in a range of different ways. And one of those is the, um, is the advent or at least the growth in what we call brand sharing. So brand sharing is where you promote a non-alcoholic offering, but you do so using the same brand iconography, the same logos, the same brand name, same colors, fonts, et cetera, um, as would have been used for the regular strength product. And here's some photos that I took in uh, Dublin in July of this year. I'm focusing particularly on Guinness just because they had a large marketing campaign while I was there. And as you can see on the left-hand side, there's adverts for Guinness Zero on an electronic screen on a bus shelter. You've got a big, large um, digital billboard in, I think, in the middle there. That must be Houston Station. And then a couple of um, uh, super sides on buses, again, advertising the Guinness Storehouse and the Gravity Bar. And in the middle of there, you've got the same digital billboard, but this time in the Connolly Station. And this, the, the purpose of these adverts is not necessarily to promote the alcohol product. It's an unrelated or linked, sorry, product using the same iconography. Although the one thing that always kind of makes me interested to hear is that if it's not an alcohol advert, I do find it interesting that it still has the get the facts, be drink aware um, message on there as well. Um, and then we're also seeing a similar thing in terms of brand sharing happening in response to the sports sponsorship restrictions. Um, so a colleague, Richard Purvis, and I have conducted a small study looking at alcohol advertising in and on the sporting area after the restrictions commenced. We were looking at both the Six Nations and the Heineken Cup. And on the left hand side there, you can see the top left, you've got an example of Guinness Zero advertising appearing around the posts um, during the Six Nations. And in the bottom, you've got similar advertising for Heineken Zero appearing during the Heineken Cup, again, both on the post, but also printed on the pitch as well. Um, I think what's particularly interesting with the Guinness one is that that advertising to all intents and purposes looks exactly the same as the advertising that was in place before the restrictions commenced, just with the advent of the, uh, the blue 0.0. And there's times where the camera angle doesn't even show that 0.0. 0 .0, so it looks to, like an alcohol advert. At least with the Heineken one, the background color isn't the same as the regular strength product. As well as brand sharing, we've also seen an increase in alibi marketing. Now, alibi marketing is different to brand sharing because brand sharing is focusing on a non-alcoholic offering, whereas alibi marketing, this is still promoting the regular strength product, but doing so without explicit reference to the brand name. So that's just using the same logo, slogan, fonts, colors, etc. So in the middle image there, you've got the Guinness logo appearing on one of the touch flags during the Six Nations. It doesn't say Guinness, it just has the logo and then the Six Nations um, underneath it, although the colors and everything else is similar to Guinness brand. At the bottom, you've got a similar thing in the Heineken Cup. You've got the large tournament logo that features in the middle. It just says Heineken not Cup, not Heine it just says Champions Cup, sorry, not Heineken Cup or Heineken Champions Cup. And above that's the tournament logo. That is also the iconic he Heineken Red Star that you can also see on the left-hand side of the image. Uh, you can see that that's also appearing on the touch flag, and then it's also appearing on the ball as well. And I know the legislation makes exemptions for clothing um, worn by participants, but I didn't necessarily think that that would extend to both the ball and all the covers around the posts. And we may also be seeing displacement of marketing in that it's not the marketing in restricted places is just moving to the places and spaces close around there that are still permitted. So, for example, in the top left there, you've got a large digital billboard that appears on a railway bridge. Now, railway bridges are technically public transport, but the legislation is either about the vehicle of tra public transport. So uh, trains, buses, um, trams, et cetera, or the designated stops. So I don't necessarily think it extends to cover infrastructure such as bridges, but that large digital billboard board is above a busy main road in Dublin and it's above a bus stop so it would be clearly visible from the bus stop so you've got advertising which is close to but not a part of same goes for the bottom left hand image you've got another example of advertising for the Guinness storehouse again just peeking around the corner of that you can see a bus coming and that digital billboard is close to and visible from a bus stop but isn't part of it so isn't covered by the legislation got a few other things as well you've got moving billboards in terms of branded delivery trucks you've got advertising you've got 
the brand name for Heineken on the side of the building, again, visible from a bus stop. And I think this is probably something that we have seen an increase in is the amount of uh, external street furniture um, linked to on-trade premises that's alcohol branded, which has perhaps increased a lot during COVID. There was an increased requirement to serve customers outside and you need the infrastructure to do that. And a lot of that that has appeared is branded. Particularly in the case of a Heineken one there, you can see that there's a bus just to the right hand side of it. That's because all that street furniture is appearing right by a bus stop. So again, it may be that people are recalling alcohol advertising on public transport, but it's not physically on the public transport. It's just moved to nearby. So is the brand sharing covered by the legislation? This is complicated and I'm in the lucky position, but it's not up to me to decide. And um, it's kind of really a matter for the legal and judicial systems in Ireland to determine. Um, for what it's worth with the brand sharing, I think it's a bit ambiguous, it's unclear, because Section 2 of the legislation defines alcohol advertising as any form of commercial communication which has the aim or the direct or indirect effect of promoting an alcohol product, goes on to give examples of the name of manufacturers, importers, name of alcohol brands, trademarks, emblem, marketing images and logos, etc. And up until this point, that would seem relatively clear that things like the Guinness Zero or the Alibi marketing would be covered under that because it seems to contain a number of the things which are listed there. But there's a further element to that clause which says uh, it's only considered to be alcohol advertising in, circum in certain circumstances where such statement, display or publication may reasonably be regarded as a recommendation of a product to the public. Um, and that term of reasonably be regarded is quite subjective it's quite tricky and um, because what you're asking there is would somebody reasonably regard that Guinness zero zero to be just promotion of the zero product or also promotion of the alcohol product as well um, and how you resolve that subjectivity is, uh, is is tricky basically and as far as I'm aware at the moment there hasn't been a particular judgment in a legal context about that. The industry view on the, uh, the brand sharing seems quite clear. So on the left hand side, you've got a quote from a, a, a newspaper article in the Irish Times quoting somebody from um, Heineken. And they talked about in relation to structural separation that as an inadvertent consequences that they've now been gifted a pre-gate opportunity to promote zero alcohol products with Heineken funding more than 1100 zero zones in grocery retailers and off licenses. And you can see an example of what they look like there. And you can see on the left hand side, it's clearly sitting just outside of the area of structural separation. This is just by the self-service checkouts in a a little or an Aldi, I can't totally remember. And then you've got a kind of front on view of it um, on the right hand side. This is actually in a different retailer, but you can clearly see Carlsberg branding, Copperberg branding, Bulmers, Heineken, etc. as well. And this is pre-gate. Um, again, on the right hand side, just in relation to sports sponsorship, a spokesperson for Diageo said that all of our activity in the Six Nation was complies with the legislation. And that was shortly before they um, put the, uh, the branding around the base of a post that said Guinness 00. Ireland's not alone in experiencing these reactions um, to the statutory restrictions, and it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag internationally as well. In France, we know that alcohol companies routinely and continue to still use alibi marketing to circumvent their Evian law restrictions. So we've done research showing the probably the best in the world alibi marketing during Euro 2016, and we've also looked similarly at the Six Nations tournament and find that Guinness replaced uh, the big Guinness in the middle of the pitch with a greatness um, instead. Um, and that seems to be, it seems to kind of be a permissive approach to that alibi marketing in France because it's been happening for a long period of time. In Lithuania, it's, a, it's again a bit of a tricky and a bit of a mixed bag. They've recently implemented statutory restrictions on alcohol marketing and initially the court upheld a complaint in relation to a zero alcohol product saying that it was classed as alcohol advertising. But then a further um, decision by the same court, which was either earlier this year or at the start of last year, then reversed that decision, saying actually there was a lack of evidence showing that consumers did confuse zero alcohol products with their alcoholic equivalents. So that seems to be a bit of an ongoing issue. And um, that paper listed there by Paul O'Brien is a, a really great read. Um, and then the one on the right hand side shows Norway, which seems to be the most organized at the moment in relation to this brand sharing and alibi marketing. They extended their legislation so that it covers any non-alcoholic offering which uses the same branding. So uh, in Norway, for example, Guinness 0.0, .0 wouldn't be able to be called or advertised as Guinness 0.0. .0. It would need an entirely different set of branding. Um, so just quickly on conclusions, uh, the continued consumer awareness shows that marketing strategies have adapted to the restrictions. And these adaptations are just hiding in plain sight and they're evident to see when you look at public transport or high profile sporting events. 
to what extent the brand sharing is compliant with the Act remains unclear from my perspective anyway. Um, and if there is any legal advice or opinion pertaining to this, then it really should be made public so that we can understand the uh, the playing field that is, um, the legislation has been monitored and enforced within. I mean, Ireland's not alone in experiencing these adapted marketing strategies, um, and there's still some way to go internationally before a consensus is reached on how best to respond. And that's me. Uh, there's just a couple of papers there. The brand sharing one is on the left-hand side. That's in the Irish Journal of Medical Science. We have a forthcoming study looking at the early impact of the restrictions. And then the report on the right-hand side by my colleague, Richard Purvis. It's a really great read just on learning about international implementation of restrictions, um, which includes Ireland as one of the case studies. And that's me. Thanks very much. Uh, listen, thanks indeed uh, for that, Nathan, and thanks also, just like, I mean, there was a whistle stop to her, you know, an, an awful lot covered uh, within that. Bobby, I'm going to hand over to you at, at this stage, maybe, and I think you had some questions that you might like to put to the panel, and indeed, if there are any questions in the chat box, box we'd be very happy to, to, uh, to, to answer those as best we can. Yep, uh, thanks very much, uh, Zubair and Nathan, and thanks, Sheila. Uh, and I guess in terms of some of the questions I know that have been coming into the chat box, I know that uh, Sheila has been uh, trying to answer those as they've, as they've been coming in. Um, so we have about five minutes just to, to uh, discuss, I suppose, a few final items. Um, I suppose, um, first of all, maybe a question for Zubair from myself. Um, it does seem that, that the adherence uh, to the recommendations regarding separation of products improved. Um, I, I just wondered, did, did you or your team uh, notice any glaring issues with the, the standards as they currently exist? You know, when you're assessing standards, you're, you're evaluating them, you know the intention is to try and reduce exposure. Um, were there things that aren't in the current regulations, you think, that that should be there? Or um, is the news as positive as, as you're suggesting? Yeah, thanks, Bobby. And and as I mentioned, like I, I wasn't on the site, so it was <laughs> my students were on the site. But it looks like from uh, the findings, uh, although it's a very selective sample, convenient sample of one uh, geography location, uh, we did see an improvement on the compliance, and that's consistent with anecdotal evidence. I think HSC had asked for some. Uh, clarifications. Uh, uh, I think erectors they asked some clarifications on the HSC. They came up with uh, some figures in 2021, if I'm correct, Sheila, uh, showing that the compliance was around hovering around 61% in 2021. So it has probably it has gone up. Uh, you heard from Nathan, you know, uh, uh, the pre gate ones, the pre gate advertisements. I, I think those are the uh, areas where. There are gaps in the in, in the implementation of this uh, uh, section 22, which uh, uh, must be addressed. Uh, but again, this is a very small sample, selected samples, uh, which may not uh, reflect the accurate picture of the whole of Ireland. But I'm sure uh, the industry, as they do, uh, which have learned from the tobacco one, uh, they will find uh, holes and gaps in the legislation. And it was very clear from, from Nathan's uh, presentation that they may want to circumvent. So, uh, but again, I think we need to have a nationwide picture to answer that question, uh, Bobby. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and, and Nathan, I, I suppose I was at a talk last week uh, at an addictions conference uh, where I suppose there was discussion about the challenge of providing treatment interventions to people with alcohol use disorders, where you do some work in the room with a person and then they leave the room and they go out into the real world and are bombarded with uh, endless messaging, reminding them about the substance they've, they, they've got and prompting them to use the substance I suppose they have a problem with. Um, the data you presented um, was really rather worrying, isn't it? That that's, you know, people seem to be, um, noticing or believing they're noticing uh, alcohol advertising via these methods that are prohibited at a frequency pretty much unchanged um, from uh, the implementation of the act. What do you think yeah. can be done to improve it? Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> how long have we got? Um, no, I think 
it's it's a, it's a tale of two halves, I think, with um, what we're seeing in changes of awareness for consumers. Like it's going, it is going in the right direction, and particularly when we compare the trends in Ireland to Northern Ireland, we can see some impact of the restrictions. But I think it's making sure that they are meaningfully monitored and enforced. It's kind of having all bark and no bite. So I think there's there's definitely something that could be done around that. I think resolving the 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 subjectivity and this uncertainty with the no lows really important because I guess for longer that it's left unresolved it then just starts to set a precedence that's then really difficult to uh, to turn around I think there are some aspects of the the legislation in terms of its provisions that I think could have been stronger I think the public transport one's relatively clear as in it's almost a blanket ban but particularly when you get into posters and billboards it's um the, the amount that it restricts is quite narrow, just to within 200 metres of certain locations and certain places and spaces, but that still leaves a large range of options and places where you can promote alcohol, particularly, as you were saying, in and around places where you can purchase alcohol as well. And I think for as long as those queues remain in those places, particularly close to the point of purchase, it's kind of unsurprising that they're going to have some impact on, as you say, a whole range of people, whether it's children, young people, dependent recovery, or just, you know, every drinkers, basically. Okay. And then maybe a final comment from each of you in that one of the, you've both drilled down into great detail into specific sort of components of the Public Health Alcohol Act, uh, and that's really valuable. And it is perhaps though one of the challenges of, of a public health perspective in this area that uh, we attend to each section individually. Uh, any thoughts on how we can bring more coherence to you know uh, delivery of, of each of these elements and and the, I suppose that wider oversight and then you've got uh, as Sheila mentioned earlier on you've got the sale of alcohol bill which seems to now be pushing uh, consumption in the opposite direction um, how can we make it all a bit more uh, joined up I, I don't mind going first on that I think um I think the first place to start is just getting all of the things that are written in the legislation implemented they're designed to work together you know, when I first read the piece of legislation which publishers think this is just literally all of the things that organizations like the WHO are suggesting that we do, but we always think about marketing in terms of like a marketing mix, it's product, place, price and promotion. And for as long as you kind of leave some elements of that untouched, then you're just displacing the marketing onus into those different avenues and it'll continue to be effective. It's, I, I don't like to talk in metaphors, but it's like baking a cake. If you leave out important ingredients, it just doesn't taste as good. And when you've got legislation that's designed to be public health, if you don't implement all of the different components of it, it's just not going to be as effective as it would be if it had been enacted completely. Yeah. And also going on that, yeah, Nathan, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Bobby, for that. Again, I'll draw my uh, experience on, on, on the tobacco one, you know, so we have this landmark framework convention on tobacco control, and all the countries, like almost like uh, 180 countries, they signed and ratified, including Ireland, but we haven't implemented it in, in, in its totality, so, so you can't do, uh, you know, have a car with the uh, real wheel from BMW and 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 the 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 front wheel from 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 Volkswagen you can't have that you know so so it has to be implemented in its entirety and the sooner we do the better and my 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 concern is about uh, you should not hobnob with the alcohol industry you know that's exactly what they did with the tobacco one you know so they were strange bedfellows and they colluded with the governments uh, in decision making so and with the sale of alcohol, being, I think Sheila quietly uh, pointed out that we need to have a centralized uh, body, but we need to regulate all these steps of implementation, which exactly was successful in the case of tobacco uh, control in Ireland. And so a similar approach has to be adopted. Thank you. Thanks. And Sheila, just regardless of time, any final thoughts from yourself? I suppose a final thought is uh, to, to our audience, actually, if you have a particular interest in, in this, um, you know, we know that we only get implementation of this act when the public make it very clear that they want it. And, you know, I look at things like, you know, the, the, the polling data that we have, 70 percent of the public want uh, the advertising restrictions to be you know, put in place. Um, really, we would be encouraging people to make make their voices heard, let uh, government know that this is the case. And I suppose supporting us uh, as we're as we're going forward here to say we need a central office that that will take ownership of that, who will find themselves 
wanting to actually you know develop better policies because that's their job that's what they want to do there isn't unfortunately that kind of um central part of of government that has that central job and if it isn't somebody's job it just doesn't get done thanks Sheila Okay, hey, well, Bobby, thank you for that. And thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you indeed to our uh, attendees. And uh, it's um, we're just coming up to 12 o'clock. So or we're just actually after 12 o'clock, sorry. And uh, we'll leave it there for, for the moment. Um, you can check out the paper online uh, that we have. And uh, we look forward to the next our, our next visit together. Thank you. Bye now.